This is the assessment of listening skills. There are four tasks in this assessment. Task 1 to task 4. You will be given instructions for each task individually. You will hear the recording twice. Assessment begins. You have 30 seconds to read the questions. In task 1, you will hear two people talking about our solar system. Read these statements below, then listen to the extracts and match each statement A to E to the respective speakers. Speaker 1 Hello, my dear students. Do you know our solar system is unique in itself? Today, we will tell you some facts about our solar system. Children, now lend me your ears. The outer solar system is the name of the planets beyond the asteroid's belt. These planets are called gas giants because they are made up of gas and ice. The first stop of our tour is the fifth planet, Jupiter. Jupiter is bigger than 300 Earths. It is made up of hydrogen and helium and a few other gases. There are violent wind storms that circle around Jupiter. The most famous storm is called the Great Red Spot. It has been churning for more than 400 years already. At last count, Jupiter has 63 known moons and a faint ring around it too. Next, in our space neighborhood comes Saturn. It is well known for the series of beautiful rings that circle it. They are made up of tiny bits of frozen dirt and ice. Like Jupiter, Saturn is made up of mostly hydrogen and helium. It is smaller though at only 95 times the size of Earth. Saturn has 62 moons. Speaker 2 The seventh planet Uranus and its 27 moons orbit is very far from the Sun. In addition to helium and hydrogen, Uranus' atmosphere also contains ammonia ice and methane ice. It is a very cold planet with no internal heat source. One of the strangest things about Uranus is that it is tipped over and orbits the Sun on its side at a 90 degree angle. The 27 moons it has orbit from top to bottom instead of left to right like our moon. The eighth planet is Neptune. Like Uranus, it is made up of hydrogen, helium, ammonia ice and methane ice. But unlike Uranus, Neptune does have an inner heat source just like Earth. It radiates twice as much heat as it receives from the Sun. Neptune's most distinctive quality is its blue color. Most of the information we know about it came from the Voyager 2 spacecraft passing close by it in 1989, 
Pluto is the last and was considered a planet after its discovery in 1930. In 2006, Pluto was demoted and reclassified as a dwarf planet. Pluto exists in the Kuiper Belt. That's just a fancy name for the band of rocks, dust and ice that lies beyond the gas giants. Scientists have found objects bigger than Pluto in this belt. Thus, the outer solar system has many secrets to explore. You will hear the recording again. Speaker 1 So, my dear students, do you know our solar system is unique in itself? Today, we will tell you some facts about our solar system. Children, now lend me your ears. The outer solar system is the name of the planets beyond the asteroids belt. These planets are called gas giants because they are made up of gas and ice. The first stop of our tour is the fifth planet, Jupiter. Jupiter is bigger than 300 Earths. It is made up of hydrogen and helium and a few other gases. There are violent wind storms that circle around Jupiter. The most famous storm is called the Great Red Spot. It has been churning for more than 400 years already. At last count, Jupiter has 63 known moons and a faint ring around it too. Next, in our space neighborhood comes Saturn. It is well known for the series of beautiful rings that circle it. They are made up of tiny bits of frozen dirt and ice. Like Jupiter, Saturn is made up of mostly hydrogen and helium. It is smaller though at only 95 times the size of Earth. Saturn has 62 moons. Speaker 2 The seventh planet Uranus and its 27 moons orbit is very far from the Sun. In addition to helium and hydrogen, Uranus' atmosphere also contains ammonia ice and methane ice. It is a very cold planet with no internal heat source. One of the strangest things about Uranus is that it is tipped over and orbits the Sun on its side at a 90 degree angle. The 27 moons it has orbit from top to bottom instead of left to right like our moon. The eighth planet is Neptune. Like Uranus, it is made up of hydrogen, helium, ammonia ice and methane ice. But unlike Uranus, Neptune does have an inner heat source just like Earth. It radiates twice as much heat as it receives from the Sun. Neptune's most distinctive quality is its blue color. Most of the information we know about it came from the Voyager 2 spacecraft passing close by it in 1989. Pluto is the last and was considered a planet after its discovery in 1930. In 2006, Pluto was demoted and reclassified as a dwarf planet. Pluto exists in the Kuiper Belt. That's just a fancy name for the band of rocks dust and ice that lies beyond the gas giants. 
scientists have found objects bigger than Pluto in this belt. Thus, the outer solar system has many secrets to explore. Now you have 10 seconds to check your answers. Task 2. You will hear some facts on the present trend among youngsters. After listening to this script, choose the correct answer from the options given below. You will hear the recording twice. Now you have 30 seconds to read the questions. These days, it is not unusual to see people listening to music or using their electronic gadgets while crossing busy roads or traveling on public transport, regardless of the risks involved. I often wondered why they take such risks. Is it because they want to exude a sense of independence? Or is it that they want to tell the world to stop bothering them? Or is it that they just want to show how cool they are? Whether it is a workman or an executive, earphones have become an inseparable part of our lives, sometimes even leading to tragicomic situations. The other day, an electrician had come to our house to fix something. We told him in detail what needed to be done. But after he left, I found that the man had done almost nothing. It later turned out that he could not hear our directions clearly because he had his headphones on. Hundreds of such earphones addicts commute by the Delhi metro every day. While one should not begrudge anyone their moments of privacy or their love for music, the fact is iPod Oblivion can sometimes be very dangerous. Recently, I was traveling with my brother on the Delhi metro. Since the train was approaching the terminus. There weren't too many passengers. In our compartment, other than us, there were only two women sitting on the other side of the aisle. And then suddenly, I spotted a duffel bag. The bomb scare lasted for several minutes. Then suddenly, a youth emerged from nowhere and picked up the bag. When we tried to stop him, he looked at us surprised. Then he took off his earpieces, lifted the bag and told us that the bag belonged to him and that he was going to get off at the next station. We were stunned but recovered in time to ask him where he was all this while. His answer was, he was in the compartment leaning against the door, totally immersed in the music. He had no clue about what was going on around him. When he got off, earplugs in his hand, we could hear 
strains of the song. You will hear the recording again. These days, it is not unusual to see people listening to music or using their electronic gadgets while crossing busy roads or traveling on public transport, regardless of the risks involved. I often wondered why they take such risks. Is it because they want to exude a sense of independence? Or is it that they want to tell the world to stop bothering them? Or is it that they just want to show how cool they are? Whether it is a workman or an executive, earphones have become an inseparable part of our lives, sometimes even leading to tragicomic situations. The other day, an electrician had come to our house to fix something. We told him in detail what needed to be done. But after he left, I found that the man had done almost nothing. It later turned out that he could not hear our directions clearly because he had his headphones on. Hundreds of such earphones addicts commute by the Delhi metro every day. While one should not begrudge anyone their moments of privacy or their love for music, the fact is iPod Oblivion can sometimes be very dangerous. Recently, I was traveling with my brother on the Delhi metro. Since the train was approaching the terminus, there weren't too many passengers. In our compartment, other than us, there were only two women sitting on the other side of the aisle. And then suddenly, I spotted a duffel bag. The bomb scare lasted for several minutes. Then suddenly, a youth emerged from nowhere and picked up the bag. When we tried to stop him, he looked at us surprised. Then he took off his earpieces, lifted the bag and told us that the bag belonged to him and that he was going to get off at the next station. We were stunned but recovered in time to ask him where he was all this while. His answer was, he was in the compartment leaning against the door, totally immersed in the music. He had no clue about what was going on around him. When he got off, earplugs in his hand, we could hear strains of the song. You have 10 seconds to check your answers. Task 3 You will hear a speech on the contribution of all the beings towards the society. Read the questions below, then listen to the talk and choose four of the options A to F which are correct. Put a cross against the wrong statement. You will hear the recording twice. It is said that everyone lives by selling something. What you can understand by this statement is that teachers live by selling knowledge, philosophers live by selling wisdom and priests earn their living by selling spiritual comfort. Though it may be possible to measure 
the value of material goods in terms of money, it is extremely difficult to estimate the true value of the services which people perform for us. There are times when we would willingly give everything we possess to save our lives, yet we might grudge paying a surgeon a high fee for offering us precisely the same service. The conditions of society are such that skills have to be paid for in the same way that goods are paid for at the shop. Everyone has something to sell. Trams seem to be the only exception to this general rule. Beggars almost sell themselves as human beings to arouse the pity of passers-by. But real tramps are not beggars. They have nothing to sell and require nothing from others. In seeking independence, they do not sacrifice their human dignity. A tramp may ask you for money, but he will never ask you to feel sorry for him. He has deliberately chosen to lead the life he leads and is fully aware of the consequences. He may never be sure where his next meal is coming from, but he is free from the thousands of anxieties which afflict other people. His few material possessions make it possible for him to move from place to place with ease. By having to sleep in the open, he gets far closer to the world of nature than most of us ever do. He may hunt, beg or steal occasionally to keep himself alive. He may even in times of real need do a little work, but he will never sacrifice his freedom. We often speak with contempt for tramps and put them in the same class as beggars. But how many of us can honestly say that we have not felt a little envious of their simple way of life and their freedom from any care in the world? You will hear the recording again. It is said that everyone lives by selling something. What you can understand by this statement is that teachers live by selling knowledge, philosophers live by selling wisdom and priests earn their living by selling spiritual comfort. Though it may be possible to measure the value of material goods in terms of money, it is extremely difficult to estimate the true value of the services which people perform for us. There are times when we would willingly give everything we possess to save our lives, yet we might grudge paying a surgeon a high fee for offering us precisely the same service. The conditions of society are such that skills have to be paid for in the same way that goods are paid for at the shop. Everyone has something to sell. Trams seem to be the only exception to this general rule. Beggars almost sell themselves as human beings to arouse the pity of passers-by. But real tramps are not beggars. They have nothing to sell and require nothing from others. In seeking independence, they do not sacrifice their human dignity. A tramp 
may ask you for money, but he will never ask you to feel sorry for him. He has deliberately chosen to lead the life he leads and is fully aware of the consequences. He may never be sure where his next meal is coming from, but he is free from the thousands of anxieties which afflict other people. His few material possessions make it possible for him to move from place to place with ease. By having to sleep in the open, he gets far closer to the world of nature than most of us ever do. He may hunt, beg or steal occasionally to keep himself alive. He may even, in times of real need, do a little work, but he will never sacrifice his freedom. We often speak with contempt for tramps and put them in the same class as beggars. But how many of us can honestly say that we have not felt a little envious of their simple way of life and their freedom from any care in the world? Now you have 10 seconds to check your answers. Task 4. You will listen to the biography of a poet. Read the sentences below. Then listen to the extract and complete the sentences with one or two words only. You will hear the recording twice. You have 30 seconds to read the questions. Robert Browning was born on May 7, 1812 in Camberwell near London. He had little of formal education but learned a great deal in his father's substantial library which had notable works on history, biography and anecdote. He was deeply influenced by his vast reading. By 17, he had decided to take up poetry as his career. He was also greatly influenced by Shelley's ideas. He was interested in studying music and paintings. In 1838, he sailed to Trieste en route for Venice. On his first visit to Italy, which he learned to love so much. In 1844, Browning noticed a compliment to himself in a poem by Elizabeth Barrett, who was a poetess of delicate health. Correspondence and visits followed. In 1846, they were secretly married, for Elizabeth's father would not consent to the marriage. Elizabeth's health improved a great deal when they left England and settled in Florence in Italy. Here their only child, Robert Barrett, 
Browning was born in 1849. Browning found deep emotional satisfaction in his marriage with Elizabeth, as reflected in some of his personal love lyrics, such as Prospice, One Word More, and By the Fireside. After his wife's death in 1861, Browning returned to England to edit her unpublished poems. He now became a highly popular figure in London society. He was honoured by Oxford with a fellowship, while Cambridge gave him an honorary degree. Browning died on December 12, 1889 in Venice and was buried in Westminster Abbey. Now you will hear the recording again. Robert Browning was born on May 7, 1812 in Camberwell near London. He had little of formal education but learned a great deal in his father's substantial library which had notable works on history biography and anecdote. He was deeply influenced by his vast reading. By 17, he had decided to take up poetry as his career. He was also greatly influenced by Shelley's ideas. He was interested in studying music and paintings. In 1838, he sailed to Trieste en route for Venice. On his first visit to Italy, which he learned to love so much. In 1844, Browning noticed a compliment to himself in a poem by Elizabeth Barrett, who was a poetess of delicate health. Correspondence and visits followed. In 1846, they were secretly married. For Elizabeth's father would not consent to the marriage. Elizabeth's health improved a great deal when they left England and settled in Florence in Italy. Here their only child, Robert Barrett Browning was born in 1849. Browning found deep emotional satisfaction in his marriage with Elizabeth, as reflected in some of his personal love lyrics, such as Prospice, One Word More, and By the Fireside. After his wife's death in 1861, Browning returned to England to edit her unpublished poems. He now became a highly popular figure in London society. He was honoured by Oxford with a fellowship, while Cambridge gave him an honorary degree. Browning died on December 12, 1889 in Venice and was buried in Westminster Abbey. You have 10 seconds to check your answers. This concludes our listening assessment.